and welcome everyone to our Pacifica webinar series. The Pacifica webinar series is a continuation of the Pacifica Scholar Summer Institute that bridges culture, community, and education through Talama and intends to amplify our Pacifica community's voices as well as provide resources for higher education at the University of Utah. This Zoom webinar will be moderated recorded and offered later on our YouTube channel, the Pacifica Archive. Special thanks to Dr. Kehalani Vaughn, our faculty advisor, Kale Tuitupo, and Kaimana Kahali for bringing this webinar into all of our living rooms. Welcome everyone to our Pacifica webinar series this evening. Um, we're excited to all have you for about an hour. This webinar series event will um, consist of learning about more of the TRIO programs at SLIC and how you can connect with them and later transfer here to the University of Utah. How our breakdown will go is that it'll be one hour. We will, after we um, provide a bio for Mika uh, Mokofisi, then we'll have her um, present and then later have any questions through a Q&A session at the very end. Um, for all those who are joining us for the first time, if you see on the webinar, there's a button on the bottom that says um, Q&A. You can click there and drop any questions. Um, or also in our chat box. Um, feel free to also raise your hand and we have that um, available through this um, Zoom platform. So um, I just want to introduce our guest before she begins. Um, her name is uh, Mika Mokofisi. She's been at Salt Lake Community College since 2013 working in several advising positions and supporting roles for the Division of Student Affairs. Currently, she's the Assistant Director over TRIO Student Support Services at SLIC in the TRIO Programs Department. Prior um, to working in TRIO, she worked in multiple higher education student development areas that promote, advocate for access, retention, and support for our underrepresented and underserved student population and communities. Um, first, she worked in admissions at SLIC, then first year experience um, at, and at the University of Utah, and then she was at Utah College Advising Corps. Uh, Corps. And after that, um, Mika um, pursued her master's degree in education, leadership, and policy with an emphasis in student affairs at the University of Utah. Her capstone focused on the post-secondary educational success of Pacific Islander students by way of, a dis of disaggregation of AAPI data and the need for a more accurate rendering of the AAPI population. Um, so without further ado, we're going to introduce Mika and she's going to present um, about the Select Trio programs. Thank you so much for, for joining us this evening and we'll turn the time over to you. Hi, thank you so much. Thanks, Mona, for that introduction. Um, yeah, we'll just wait for my presentation to come up. Thank you, Mona. Um, and thanks for having me um, this evening. I'm here to talk about TRIO Student Support Services at Salt Lake Community College. Um, I've been at Salt Lake Community College since I was I, almost directly out of my undergrad um, from the University of Utah. Um, but I say I've been in, at in trio programs, or I'm sorry, at Salt Lake Community College, like all of my 20s, basically. Um, and so I have a, a good connection and um, this experience in a community college context, um, which I'm super proud about. And I, and I love the community college and I love being there. Um, but Anyway, I'm here to talk about TRIO Student Support Services. I'm currently the assistant director in that office. Um, yeah, and we can move on to the next slide. Some community guidelines. Um, 
let's be present in this presentation. Um, let's engage via the chat box. Feel free to, um, if you agree with things I'm saying or what others are saying, please utilize that chat box um, and let's make this a, a discussion. Um, ask questions via the chat, bo chat box or while talking. Um, be curious and think critically about the information being presented um, and lean into and explore discomfort felt throughout these topic discussions. Um, who who do we serve? Who do TRIO programs serve? Um, and I think everyone knows this. I think TRIO has been long enough, or been, been around long enough that um, that we've presented so many times in, with, with students um, that we're pretty, I would say we're pretty well known. If you don't know um, what TRIO programs are, we are a federally funded program. Um, and first and foremost, we do um, service and support first generation college students. If you wanna flip over to that slide. Um, and first generation college students, thank you are defined as students from families where their biological parents did not complete a four-year college degree. Um, and a lot of students don't always know this. I didn't know this as an undergrad at the University of Utah. Um, so I passed up a lot of opportunities. I, I think I talked about this too in the, um, in the summer bridge program um, video archives that we did, but I always talk about that I did not know I was a first generation college student throughout my entire undergraduate program. Um, so I passed up a lot of opportunities and services and resources offered to first gen students because I was like, I'm not first gen. My I ha, I have older brothers and sisters who um, had graduated and completed at the U and had degrees, and I thought it was a it was a sibling thing, which is so funny because you know that's also a first generation um, way of thinking. Sometimes is I just didn't know what for a first generation student meant, um, and so we always try to. Um, push the definition and really help students know and define what a first generation student is. So again, first generation students are students from families where their biological parents did not complete a four year degree. Um, um, our second group of students that we service and support are, are our Pell eligible students. Um, basically Pell eligible students, or you might um, hear Pell eligible students be referred to as low income students. And we'll talk a little bit about that language later in the presentation. Um, but basically Pell eligible students are students who, if you filed your FAFSA and you re received the Pell grant, you might just be likely to be eligible for TRIO programs. Um, or even if you just file your um, federal financial aid, um, file the FAFSA and receive funding, um, there's a good chance that you meet necessary federal income guidelines to be a part of TRIO or to be an active participant within TRIO. Um, we pretty much do the work for you, our advisors do, um, so you don't have to worry too much about, wait, am I first gen or am I um, Pell eligible? Um, would I be eligible for this program? A lot of students at Salt Lake Community College do not know that they are TRIO, trio eligible. Um, and so, but there's help and support. We have advisors that help you um, determine if you are eligible for our program. So those two groups are who we, are who, what, TRIO programs really focus on and who we strive to serve and support. Um, you do not have to be both Pell eligible and a first generation college student. You can be either or. Um, and if you are both, you're Pell eligible and a first generation student, great. Um, but uh, again, you don't have to be both. You can, you can just be um, eligible in, in one of the other spaces. Um, some of the service that we services that we do offer at Trio SLCC, um, and again, students know this. Uh, we're just another resource for support um, for students is, for students on campus. Um, we do offer a study lounge on campus. Um, it's kind of nice. Well, it's changed a little bit because of COVID nineteen, so um, we don't get a lot of foot traffic from students, but. Um, we do have a study lounge where students can come to and hang out and eat their lunch and chat and and really while they're doing that they're really building community. Um, so we do offer that we we offer a true peer leadership team, so we do hire on part time um, staff who are students so any SLCC students that are looking for a part time job, we also have those available on campus. Um, but our peer leaders do help us build and develop our community um, and make those peer to peer connections with students. Um, our advisors provide personalized academic advising um, and planning. 
Um, they offer um, registration support and help. Um, they help you navigate and provide fin financial aid and scholarship opportunities. We have a whole bunch of um, tuition waivers um, where your tuition is waived, basically. Um, we have a lot of opportunities for um, stipend awards. Um, again, we are um, federally funded. Um, so we get a lot of funding and we need students to give give this money to and I love nothing more than giving students money to um, pay for college pay for their classes. Um, in center tutoring we do have in house tutoring and that's part of our peer leadership team, we also hire. Um, what we call them trio peer tutors um, they are students um, some have graduated recently graduated and and want to come back and tutor um, it is a hired position it's a paid position so again another opportunity to find employment on campus is through our tutoring um, and then our advisors also provide transfer preparation we have a good partnership with Westminster College which I will talk about later in this presentation um, career planning. Our advisors provide that as well. Undergraduate research opportunities. Um, we host the undergraduate, I'm sorry, I should get the full name of it. We offer or we host um, the Bruin Brains Undergraduate Research Conference. Oh, that's a lot, but, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So research opportunities on campus housed in TRIO, kind of cool. Um, and then also um, our advisors, have internship opportunities as well but know that trio is a place for you um, you can come in and use the space build community with other trio students and trio peers um, but we're a fun staff i like to say we're a fun staff um, i think next up oh real quick participant application if you want to be a part of trio programs super easy just go to slcc.edu backslash trio um, and students you guys are all good at uh, researching. Um, just type in TRIO um, anywhere on the slcc.edu webpage. Um, you'll find our participant application. Thank you. Uh, participant application um, online. Um, just complete it. It's a, there's a fillable PDF form. Um, it's pretty straightforward. If you need any help with it, just ask. Um, ask any one of our staff. Um, but you can submit in person or via email to any TRIO advisor. Um, and then this is my wonderful staff. Um, we have Adrian Howell. I have two advisors. Um, we, we do have two TRIO SSS advisors, uh, but Adrian Howell just started with us February 1. Um, a lot of students might know Adrian because she has, she has several years of experience in higher education. She's been at the University of Utah for a long time. I believe she was also a UCAC advisor like I was. Um, but she's awesome and she's passionate about um, students and student success, passionate about supporting um, first gen students um, and, and students who have um, TRIO backgrounds. Um, Adrienne was also a TRIO alum herself. Um, she's a former Upward Bound and TRIO SSS participant herself. So kind of full circle there for Adrienne. It's kind of nice to have her back in TRIO um, and now service, serving as an advisor, which is kind of cool. And then my second advisor, Allah Al-Bakari, um, she's awesome as well. Um, she has, her previous work was in um, immigrant and refugee populations, um, but she she's also, I'm sorry, she was also a part of the Westminster College McNair Scholars Program. Um, that's another trio program and i'll talk about Westminster um, McNair Scholars Program um, later on as well. But these two advisors, super awesome great advisors, very responsive. Um, email them with any questions um, that you might have and that you can find their contact information on our webpage as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, yeah, so um, at TRIO we offer um, or we host a undergraduate research conference that we call Brewer and Brains. Um, this was a student driven um, research conference. Um, and I wanted to talk about Brewer and Brains because a lot of um, students don't know know this about TRIO. Um, I think everyone knows what our services are, what we offer. We offer advising and tutoring um, and all of the regular student support things, but also we have this space for undergraduate research, um, 
Brewing Brains in particular honors diversity in academia, um, honors inclusion and diversity in research. Um, sorry, um, it, Brewing Brains started um, from, let's see, it started really with TRIO STEM students. And I don't think I explained that earlier, but um, at Salt Lake Community College, we have three different STEM, or I'm sorry, three different TRIO programs. One of them obviously being TRIO Student Support Services, which I'm over with Alan Adrian. And then we also have a program um, which um, basically takes on all of the STEM majors. Um, SSS takes on any non-STEM majors. Um, and then we have a TRIO ETS program in ETS. They're, they're a part of the high school. Um, some students may be familiar with TRIO ETS because um, they do service a few junior highs and high schools. Um, all three programs, it's tr they're TRIO. We're different, but we're the same. We're, we're all TRIO. We all get um, funded. Um, by the federal government, um, but we also have the same goals and priorities um, in supporting first gen and Pell eligible students. Um, but really this Brewing Brains Research Conference started out of TRIO STEM um, because STEM majors wanted a space to receive feedback, to present the research first of all, and then to also receive feedback from faculty. Um, when I came into the, to the position as the SSS um, Assistant Director, we also wanted Brew and Brains to come into um, non-STEM majors or be available. It wasn't that it wasn't ever available to non-STEM majors, but we just did a better push and marketing campaign to encourage non-STEM SLCC students to present the research at Brew and Brains. Um, and and it, it's actually been really successful. Um, we are going on our I believe last year we just had one in 2020. That was our um, fourth year. But why it matters, I'm going to have it. Thank you. <laughs> um, but why it matters um, and why does undergraduate research at a community college matter? Um, the messaging that we're, we are um, giving out to students is that you can do research, um, that you are an academic scholar, that you, you, you are your community college student and you can do research. Um, we're telling students that it's important that you can engage, that you do engage in research early on in your education. Um, we wanna let students know that there are resources and support systems to help, which, which is TRIO. Um, there was never really a space um, at Salt Lake Community College, there was never really um, a central space where students could get real hands-on um, undergraduate research opportunities. There's never been a formal space. People have probably, they would do that um, individually or with a faculty member that they might've met, um, but TRIO is providing a space where we can do this formally. Um, and we've developed um, an area where students can um, meet other faculty or faculty can connect with students um, if they do have a research project in mind or working on something that they would like to include students on. So now, now there are resources and support put in place um, that's, that's led by TRIO right now. Um, we also wanna let students know that their identity and unique lived experiences are salient qualities that positively contribute to their research. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about identity a little bit later and what that means. Um, and then we also want to let students know that they can develop their, through this conference, through doing research, conducting research, um, we hope that it develops students' growing academic identity and their competency beliefs surrounding research so that students know that, you know, it's not just someone in a lab coat that can do research, or it's not just um, biology and chemistry majors that can that can do research and provide um, legitimate research. But um, we've been opening up the idea of what research means to students um, and getting them involved in that. And then my next two slides, my first one, um, my next two slides show um, these are TRIO students and also um, TRIO peer leaders, um, and they identify as um, Pacific Islander, Polynesian. Um, and so I just wanted to showcase them and their work. Um, this is Sepa Faupula. Um, 
she did present at the Bruin Brains undergraduate conference last year. I believe, no, this was not last year. We weren't in person last year. Um, we held the all virtual Bruin Brains conference last year because of obviously because of COVID, but this was 2019 then. But this was SEPA's research and SEPA is a biology major. Um, so she is a STEM student. Um, her title was Does Sleep Affect You? A study in how sleep affects our mental health. So really cool and great for Sepa. She's a super involved student um, and a good um, representation for our PI students at SLCC. And then our next student I had featured is Marosa. Um, she, she too presented um, at our conference in 2019. She focused, she's a non-STEM major, but her focus was on Pacifica women, um, which is great as well, but Pacifica women, the diaspora, how Pacifica women are critical to Oceania culture and advocacy. Um, Marosa is currently a University of Utah graduate. I know she's in the um, works of getting into a graduate program as well. So congrats to Marosa, but these are just two um, really awesome um, and powerful um, Pacific Islander women um, and students that I wanted to share. Um, our Westminster College McNair Scholars Program. And this program draws students from SLCC, from our programs at TRIO, um, SSS or STEM. Um, but they, they do a lot of recruitment and outreach from our programs to get students into their program once, when our students are ready to transfer. Um, SLCC, we're at SLCC, more than half, almost 60, 70% of our students, when they graduate, they do transfer onto a four-year institution. Um, so McNair Scholars takes advantage of that. And they, um, they rec recruit and outreach to our students um, and then um, allow them to be a part of this program called McNair Scholars. Really great program. It, it encourages transfer. Um, and it, it encourages undergraduate research. So when you are a McNair scholar, or when our TRIO students become McNair scholars, they too have to um, um, perform some type of research or conduct some type of research for their end of year uh, McNair scholars requirements. It's part of their requirements. So it's kind of cool that our students are already getting the experience um, under their belt from Bruin Brains, doing research there and then graduating um, and transferring and then um, conducting more research. So um, we thought it's a, a nice alignment for our students to get so much experience in conducting research. I myself didn't do a real research project, I would say, until honestly my graduate um, degree, until I was in my graduate program. So um, we think it's awesome that our students can participate in research. Um, so early on um, and while at Salt Lake Community College. Um, but the goal of the McNair Scholars Program is to increase faculty diversity in colleges and universities um, because they reiterate getting a PhD so well, and that's the transfer piece. Um, so after getting a, a bachelor's degree, they um, really encourage their scholars to move on um, and support them and help them through getting into a graduate program, master's and a PhD. So great program. And we have a good partnership with them. They're good people over there. Um, education and research barriers, just some things I wanted to share um, that kind of comes out of my um, Oh, I forgot what it's called, my capstone course, I would say, for my graduate program. Um, but we know that there's a lack of research on Pacific Islander students. And I just wanted to read two quotes here that I um, had included in my research um, in my graduate program. Um, but there remain several gaps and una unanswered questions about PI college students specifically. Research on PIs can be found primarily in unpublished doctoral dissertations or master's theses, um, and these are not always viewed as peer reviewed or legitimized. And we really get into that nitty gritty of like, what is research? Um, when TRIO starts involving like faculty and academics and all that bureaucracy that comes, um, comes with research or doing research. Um, yes, but anyway, um, we know that our, um, PIs in research um, were not um, 
I would say, always seen. Um, we know that there's a lack of inclusion of Pacific Islander Americans in our curriculum, um, in our scholarship, in our teaching, in our, in, in our pedagogy in higher education. Um, so if any students want to do any research on um, Pacific Islander students, that would be cool and come and present at Broom Brains, that would be great. But um, yeah, and then this other quote, as Pacific Islanders, our legitimacy as scholars, um, I quote, in Western academia is extremely limited. There are not many indigenous PIs who are able to write and publish about ourselves in our communities. Uh, but programs like this, what we're doing here, um, or what Moana is doing um, in your group, um, I think this will help um, alleviate that or, or add to um, this work and research around um, the inclusion um, of PIs. So thank you for doing this. Um, and we all know that TRIO programs, and there's and there's TRIO programs all across the United States. There's TRIO programs at almost every college, university, um, community college all across the United States. But we know that TRIO programs um, were designed to help those who have been historically underrepresented in higher education. And then this is where I'm going to kind of do a, a little bit of a pivot um, in talking about TRIO. We know what TRIO is, or now we know who, what TRIO is and who TRIO serves um, and what our goals and priorities are in TRIO. Um, and then this, I guess this is kind of a um, critique on TRIO <laughs> or a critique on um, college access programs or college student support programs um, and just an awareness that language um, is an avenue where we engage in deficit framing without even considering the implications. Um, you would have heard when I speak about TRIO or when I, we speak about um, other college access type programs um, and who we service, we usually um, use terms for students like these listed here, high need students, at risk students, low income and minority students, high poverty, high achieving student, students in schools, underrepresented minorities um, and disadvantaged. Um, these terms are very much deficit framing or, of our students um, and kind of limited, limiting students' um, identities. Um, Deficit framing was created for the purpose of categorizing people, um, but you know, really just based on beliefs about groups of people, but not biology. Um, it, 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 we know that deficit framing um, it also include, it includes race. We, we categorize people with, with race and class and gender, identity, sexuality, ability, religion. Um, they were also um, created by society to really label or categorize people, um, you know, and while category, cat categories and labels are not inherently bad, it's the value um, assigned to these categories and the difference making between an, a high achieving student and, uh, you know, what does that mean for a non high achieving student? So the differences that it's making, um, that's where it's problematic. Um, Yes, so that's kind of what I want to get into in the next slide as well. Um, so if you want to put, and I don't know if I could even do this right now, but if folks want to respond to the following questions or think about these deficit messages, um, here's a few questions to think about. What are deficit messages we receive about first-generation students? Um, we know that we also can assume that, you know, like, all Pacific Islander students are first generation. Um, I think a lot of students assume, or a lot of, I would say folks, um, assume that all first generation students are students of color or are people of color. Um, that all first generation students are, um, th th there's obviously assumptions about around first generation students. Um, and we really, at TRIO, we really want to empower students behind the first generation definition um, that it's not a bad thing to be a first generation student, that it's actually a very impactful, powerful thing to be a first generation student. And then 
Um, the next question, you know, just kind of think about what are deficit messages we receive about low income underrepresented students. Um, and those are some things, you know, that, you know, programs like TRIO, um, these college access type programs, programs that again, support TRIO backgrounded students um, should be careful about our, our, you know, sending these deficit messages through language used like this through this deficit language. Um, and then the next slide. Thank you. Um, so here's kind of my critique. <laughs> um, instead of, so programs like TRIO should um, recognize and acknowledge the complexity of holding both and. Um, and instead of just focusing on everything is either or, but that things can be both and for students uh, and for students and for their identities and their experiences um, can be both and. Um, in TRIO, there's, you know, historically TRIO does have a responsibility to work toward liberation and justice. And um, I think we can show this more by the language we use. Um, TRIO programs are also centered, they're rooted in social justice. Um, TRIO programs started from, from um, social justice acts and that work. Um, so TRIO programs must be student centered. We must frame student, and, and we do this a lot um, in TRIO type of programs, but we frame staff and faculty as the experts or the knowledge holders, the experts of knowledge, and they are teaching you. Um, but how do we shift to honoring students as knowledge holders that they too um, are, are experts, they are academics, they are scholars, um, and they're experts in their own experiences and needs. Um, so we must move away from a deficit framework to an asset, asset, asset-based framework um and know that you know not all people with a shared identity so you know not all of our trio students or not our our entire trio cohort um shares the same perspective although they all might be um first generation they all might be um pell eligible they might share i share same identities but not share the same perspectives um but of course there's also some common experiences that they might they might hold hold amongst themselves but we should um, recognize and acknowledge um, differences and that we we all experience multiple identities at once and then another and then another question um, reflecting on um, students intersecting identities and the whole student and showing up as a whole student um, share some identities that you hold also as a student or think about those identities, those other identities that you hold as, as um, a person. Um, again, we all experience multiple identities at once. Um, you can be a scholar, a caregiver, you can be a parent, um, you can be Tongan and not Pacific Islander, right? You know, there's some folks that are like, um, you know, don't resonate with the term Pacific Islander, but resonate with being Tongan. Um, students, you know, they can be first gen, they can be a first generation Tongan American, they can be immigrants, they can be um, daughters and sons of immigrants. Um, so all of these identities um, that we know students have, um, but we should also more so recognize in our students as well. And then the last slide, um, really in honor of Black History Month and in honor of um, this fight against this anti-Black climate that's happening, um, you know, and this fight that um, even non-Black people of color um, are also benefiting from, like ourselves. Um, I did want to include Audre Lorde's quote here um, that I think fits well with, with all of these identities that we hold, um, that there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives and how true that is that we must um, embrace our whole identities um, and shed the notion of single issue struggles. So I think that's it. 
Um, and then I have, oh, okay. I, had, I just had a reference page <laughs> and a contact page, but. Okay, can we show that so that we can, uh... Thanks, Mana. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have an Instagram page, follow us. We, you'll probably be the most updated with us and our, what we're doing in our office. If you follow that Instagram page, we're always on there um, posting updates. You'll, you'll probably be really informed with everything the college has to offer. Um, we all have like Insta, Instagram pages right now. So we're always sharing each other's things, sharing each other's events. Um, so you'll be really informed if you follow that page. Um, but there's my contact information too, if you wanna contact me directly. Well, thank you, Mika, for sharing all that um, with us. I think this is uh, near and dear to me because I'm a uh, upward bound alum and I went to the University of Utah and did upward bound there. Um, so there's just a few questions that I had for you, especially um, in the parts that you're pushing back you as a first generation student yourself and then not knowing those things. Um, that you actually qualified for programs like this. So for our Pacifica Bridge program, um, a lot of them are first gen and uh, quote unquote non-traditional students. And I know that you did your um, graduate research on this. And so I just wanted to dig a little bit deeper on what you found. Um, you said that um, your, your graduate research suggested disaggregating AAPI would help alleviate challenges to post-secondary um, ed completion. So what are some of these challenges that you found in your research and that you also just grapple with um, on a day-to-day -day basis at, since you've been working at SLIC since you were an undergrad, I mean, uh, fresh out of undergrad? Um, and I can actually say, good question, thank you. Um, but I can actually say Salt Lake Community College does a good job at um, disaggregating the data because we actually, we have like a column. We, you know, we, we have a box that says PI and then, you know, how we're doing in persistence rates, how we're doing um, retention rates. So like we're identified, we're, we're there um, in the data at Salt Lake Community College. So I commend them and, you know, probably other institutions too also do commend us, but it's when, um, we are grouped too often with Asian Americans when we can experience, we, with, we are experiencing um, different challenges or different successes in education and through our educational journey. Um, but when we're too often um, aggregated with the Asian American um, community, um, our needs um, can't be directed if they don't know that we even exist or that we're there, we're showing in the data. Um, but I do appreciate SLCC's data that um, it's very specific. There's specific group. We know that the needs are different for different groups. Um, and so the data is separated that way. What have you seen in terms of the transitioning or transferring to the University of Utah? You talked about uh, Westminster's program, but what, what would be some opportunities specifically for trio to trio um, here at the university um, that could support that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think transfer articulation in and of itself is like this huge, complex, confusing thing. Um, for institutions of higher education, and then obviously for students as well. Then when it comes to students, super hard to transfer. Um, yeah, I think we can always do a better job at the connection with TRIO programs. Um, we can always do a better job at that funnel or that pipeline as well, connecting. And it, I mean, it happens, um, you know, we get we get referrals from you know some folks that went to the University of Utah, um, but needed to come back to the community college, um, did a reverse transfer. I don't want to use too heavy of like student affairs terms here, but um, yeah, I mean, it, I know what's happening. There, there is connection with folks from the University of Utah um, in trio programs or other college access type programs where they will shoot me an email or shoot one of my advisors an email like, here's the student 
look out for them. Here's a contact information. Can you help them out? It's happening, but again, just kind of in siloed, um, in a siloed way. Um, and I know we can do better at that. We need to figure out a better process of how we're, um, how we are con connecting our students and do we know, did they ever get to um, Adrian, you know, or did they ever get to Allah um, and how are they doing? There's nothing um, super formal there yet. Um, it, it really is just based on like relationships, for instance, um, Westminster College, our um, old director um, just had a really good relationship with their director um, there as well. And so it was really just um, because they knew each other. Um, but yeah, I would definitely want to do better. I want to know how do we do that too? Or how do we recreate those um, substantial, strong relationship, strong relationships? Um, or how do we better develop our relationships with other institutions to um, have better transfer outcomes? What have you seen was the, um, with your work with students, um, particularly if you do have any um, experience with Pacific Islanders has been some of the biggest challenges for them at the, like, at the Salt Lake Community College level. What are challenges that SLCC PI students are facing? Yeah, have you recognized anecdotally or with your research um, that kind of are challenges or barriers for coming here to the university? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, I would definitely say that there's, well, um, financial aid and funding is always number one, always comes up in the research um, and our collection of data and assessment at the college. Um, financial aid always comes up for PI students um, and first gen students. Um, that that's one of the main barriers and it's been one of the main barriers since I've been at the college since 2013 and I look through the data or we're getting information um, that it's always financial aid is always an issue and I think will probably always be um, an issue but um, um, we know it's that. Also um, both anecdotal, anecdotally and um, um, through survey responses with PI students on campus. Um, a lot of times PI students are not feeling a sense of connection or a sense of belonging on campus, or they're trying to find their footing or like a space to be a part of. And then I'm like over here, like trio, come to trio. Or when I was in FYE, I'm like, FYE, we're like a community here. Um, yeah, but I, I believe um, with PI students attending SLCC, um, it's, it's finding that sense of community, that sense of, yeah, belonging on campus. Um, we do have the pool club. Um, then, you know, another, you know, issue that I, I'm, is this all being recorded? No, <laughs> it's okay. Maybe you can cut this out, but also just like, um, um, if, you know, folks too often, like looking at the, we have a, what do we call them? A Pacific Islander success coach. There's also a African-American su success coach. I'm probably not using, but there's um, advisors for the different affinity groups on campus. But um, way too often we look to that one person and say like, why aren't our PI students succeeding? Um, or looking to that one person or that one group like PUA um, to like solve everything to like, make everyone feel welcome and a part of the community when really it's it's supposed to be or it should be um, a college-wide effort to get all a college-wide effort to get all PI students to succeed instead of just looking at one office or one position um, or one club to do all the work. Well yeah and I think you're pointing to something that's like systemically and institutionally where um, I think I read this quote about how it, how just like because we're we're not acknowledging too with in terms of diversity and integration like you're asking students of color to go into other hostile sometimes hostile environments where they're the only person representing their whole race and then okay. that sense yeah. of belonging can't happen because of that and then um, some tokenizing can occur when you only um, put everybody into one of these um, 
groups or have only one person that's to tend to all of their needs. Yep. And coming out of like just diversity work on a policy level, I was continually um, coming into that. And then now working in higher um, ed institutions, I'm like, oh, it's all this, it's all the same. <laughs> um, so it's like, so people, happening. like, yeah. Yeah, and if you know, and then always if, if an institution can, you know, I see um, institutions prioritizing a group of folks by putting money in front of it as well, you know? Um, so yeah. offering more opportunities for funding specifically for PI students. Yeah, budget don't hurt. <laughs> exactly, yeah. A budget don't hurt and uh, more exactly. uh, people power <laughs> does not hurt yeah. either. To yeah. The system. Yeah. Um, and I think that too, in like for the future of uh, higher ed and just belonging now there, including that into the diversity, equity, inclusion yeah. discussions, uh, yeah. will need to be something that um, I think on the highest levels, yeah. these institutions need to be reckoned with. Yep, and then it's just even harder now with, you know, the pandemic and then folk, you know, us being in a dispersed setting and now it's just even more difficult to create a sense of space and belonging um, for PI students or for any of our trio students, um, because now we're just so dispersed and we just meet like this, you know, um, and it's harder to um, develop relationships or create community. We're trying and we're still doing it. We're, you know, trying to muscle through this what we're in right now but yeah it definitely makes it you know, so much more harder um to um integrate and you know, our students better to make them feel like they, they they have a space here on campus when we're on a virtual campus now so it's hard but sure. <laughs> um a couple of uh just like probably a couple more questions and then our our time is over but um I wanted to go back to you talking about the deficit framing of first generation students and um, how does how do people like you who work in these types of positions push push back on it when so often uh, I always tell this to my students who I'm like, I guess if you're cognizant that this essay you're writing is a bit, you know, telling your sob story so you can get a scholarship. <laughs> I was like, is that necessarily a bad thing? I don't know, the, you choose. But like uh, being able to empower my students and say like, you don't have to show all your trauma to get a dollar. But then recognizing since TRIO was established back in was it Johnson, um, Johnson era, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's Johnson. like you kind of yeah. have to tell these types of narratives for the program to continue being funded. And this is me coming from somebody who is a direct um, recipient of this uh, type of funding. But how do you as a person um, who's understanding how these systems work push back against that deficit framing when so often it's easier, like that grit conversation to just like, you know, just pull yourself out of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I do admit, you know, that I've, um... I fell into this deficit framing <laughs> of students. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely admit to that. But um, yeah, I think the little things that I'm trying to do is just talking about it. Like in this presentation, I was like, you know, I'm not going to go in there and just talk about what TRIA, we all know what TRIA does and who we serve. Um, but I want to get a little bit more into um, yeah, this, this, these identities and this deficit framing that we too often do in higher education. Um, oh, I was gonna say something else. We, so the, the, those small things, talking about it more in presentations when I get the opportunity to, um, in our application, we've um, up, can you believe we only, we've updated our application and use these new terms, really just like when I got into the, I joined TRIO, what in 2018, end of 2018, almost 2019, and we're just now um, saying Pell eligible instead of low income. Um, <laughs> also, I was there in 2000, what was that? <laughs> the early 2000s. Oh my gosh, I'm yeah. dating myself, but 
yeah it was never when i saw that on your I was like, eligible you yeah, so that's like eligible? Our new, yeah it's our new term we're using people shouldn't yeah people shouldn't be ashamed of it but like yeah it is kind of like Oh, low income, like, you know, I'm always, you know, referred to as low income. So Pell eligible also then just um, celebrating these identities as well, like being a first generation college student. Um, we recently just did the national um, celebrate first gen um, campaign on our campus. Um, it's our third year now doing it. Um, and so we, we want to celebrate this identity knowing that first generation is um, um, a good thing, you know, that's, it's a, it's a identity that you should embrace, um, you know, being the first in your family to, um, pursue higher education is amazing and you should be proud of that. And so, um, that to bringing, um, empowering students through, um, these identities as well that they probably didn't even know they had um, or just came into and they're like you know they don't really resonate with first gen like what does first gen mean um, so getting them proud um, about themselves and what and what they're accomplishing so that's how I'm trying to help and support <laughs> well yeah and I think the just the process of you sharing in these um, in the powerpoints I think that that's powerful. Yeah, I yeah. I like, I, I was yeah. like, hey, should I do this? I think I will. <laughs> and just understanding, you're like, yeah, I work through these systems, but this yeah. is how we help. We still help students. Yeah. Well, okay. So another question we have is, um, you mentioned how Trio creates comfortability and space for PI students within the unfamiliar territory of the academy. I'm just wondering, how does Trio provide spaces of belonging for diasporic Pacific Islanders? Who may want to reconnect with their roots or homelands within the mm. Pacific? That's that's a very good question, and we're probably not doing that the best, but um, yeah, we can definitely look at that. Um, I think just me and in, in my own identity coming in as the true assistant director, um, I think that was big in and of itself for students to see that. Um, and they are not, you know, I've been at Salt Lake Community College for a good amount of years before I came into this position. So um, I already knew a lot of students, um, you know, who then followed me also to TRIO and who are now TRIO students, which is um, great, you know, to do that work and then come into this role. Um, but I do think that, you know, my own experiences and identities as a Tongan Pacific Islander, um, professional in higher education um, helps. Um, um, I think me, the way I choose my um, staff as well, um, having Allah and Adrian, I am, um, I'm critical about who I choose to be on my, um, to be advisors to trio students because they're so important to me. Um, little things like I hang up my <laughs> little, um, what is it? We do the our poster research, um, hang that up on the wall for students to see, and then encouraging students to be a part of Bruin Brains. Um, and we've gotten, you know, more than just SEPA and um, not just, but um, outside of SEPA and Morosa, we've gotten other PI students to come be a part of um, um, presenting their research. And sometimes it is around PI experiences. Um, and then we have those hanging up around campus as well, or in our offices as well and showcasing those. So um, it, it's happening. We, and yeah, we can, we can always do better to provide stronger spaces um, for students to feel a sense of belonging. I think that uh, dovetails well in the next question of, uh, so how was your, how has your educational journey you, you, there's touch points through what you've talked about, but how's your educational journey influenced the way you work with and interact with students? Ooh, good question. How's my educational journey influenced? Um, I think it's because I've totally been there. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been the first gen student, the undergrad student, um, and I, I honestly, when I, that's how I connect with students um, be, because I went to the University of Utah, predominantly white institution, I was probably, um, you know, 
if not the only one, but, you know, amongst a few POCs in the class, you know, um, but definitely I, I do attribute um, my work in social justice and, and my education in social justice work and diversity work and equity work, I do attribute that to gaining that from the University of Utah and opening my eyes to that, which I'm um, so grateful for. Um, but yeah, I, th I think I just use my own personal experiences as being a student and like what did students want or need, what did I want or need when I was a college student and just responding to that. Um, and then having conversations with my advisors on um, how how we're advising students. A lot of times where we um, are getting, how we advise students is they're telling us what they need. And so we're, we have been, um, I think my advisors, I should attribute them, but they've been doing a really great job at listening and hearing students' needs and concerns. Um, and then also using your own experience as, um, as students of color um, on a college campus in Utah, <laughs> in Utah, even that experience too. Um, so yeah, I think my educational influence, um, my work in the big way, and I'm always thinking about, you know, my college days and what I experienced um, when I'm in my work today. Well, thank you, Mika, on that note of, of all the work that you're doing there at Slick and um, representation isn't everything, but it's, it's needed. It's a part of, of that feeling of belonging. And um, we're grateful that you're there and you're in that position and serving all the different students there. Um, and also for staying connected with us here at the University of Utah with our Pacific Island Studies Initiative. Um, we're coming up to the top of the hour, so we're just going to close, but um, if there's anything you need from us and we'd love to share and continue having you as a guest and um, sharing all the TRIO programs, um, uh, knowing that they're internships, that they're brewing brains, that um, any of the students can reach out to you um, if, they, if they ever have any questions. Um, so thank you for coming this evening and for joining us. And we're so appreciative of your time and um, hopefully you can join us again in another of our webinar series events. Yay, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And I'm, I love what you guys are doing with this. I think this is so great. Um, but yes, thank you so much. Um, and thanks for thinking of me and thinking of TRIO. So appreciate it. We love TRIO. <laughs> Yes, we, were, we could see the where it can grow and things, but we love you. <laughs> yeah. We have so many full circle, full circle trio folks, you know, like Adrian, like yourself that um, want to come back and do this work. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you. to all our contributors, specifically our bridge team, school of transport, education, culture, and society, and again, Dr. Kehaulani. Remember to join us every other Friday evening as we tell along with Pacifica scholars, staff, and community leaders. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us at U of U Pacifica scholars and the Pacifica archive. Till next time, to all of us.